department at UCT. Um, and then we have uh, Colin Goldblatt, he's a postgraduate fellow at this university um, and he's part of the UKAPI Research Collective. And then we have Puleng, um, who's the sole speaker today because her co-writer um, of this paper is in Ghana and couldn't sort out her, her visa in time. And she uh, works in the psychology department at UNISA. And I'm really looking forward to uh, what promises to be quite a diverse and fascinating pan panel. So we're going to start with Kamita's uh, paper which um, comes from a chapter she's conceptualizing that she's working on for her PhD, Creating Disability in Time, ep Epistemic Fallacies, Temporal Stakes. Thank you so much. Um, this is, the chapter's in its very, very earliest phases, so I'm inviting you to think with me. I don't have a flourish of an argument. <laughs> um, um, the argument is still in motion. Um, at the time that I sent in the abstract, I was doing a review of Mbembe's critique of black reason. Um, whilst doing the review, I realized that, what well, one, we know it's Mbembe, so it's really a critique of male reason. <laughs> and the question I asked um, that, that I left with was, what is, one, what is this androcentric archive? Cause archive um, produce for us epistemically and what makes this archive possible and which, which forms of temporality can we find within Mbembe's formulation of the collapse of life into death um, because the conflation of life into death um, produces an epistemic, epistemic effect and this form of temporality um, not only erases other archives but it also um, erases forms of life as they're occurring. Um, my PhD project is, it, it looks at disability and I'm interested in trying to think about how thinking with disability allows us to reimagine ontology, epistemology, politics, methodology and, and the ethical. Um, <coughs> um, the, the, question has, so how does this, okay, so, so the, form, the, the way in which I'm thinking about um, this chapter has shifted markedly from the moment that I wrote the abstract, which was mo mainly theoretical and mainly focused on the natural politics. Um, how I'm trying to think about it now is to think about what stories of death with my participants who, who I'm not in the analysis, what the stories of death um, that came through during, during the course of, of producing these life histories, what these might tell us about death, and then to speak back to the natural political theory. So just to ground, ground some of the ideas around disability and temporality, um, most Disability theory comes from the global north. Um, most people with disabilities, 80% of people with disabilities live in the global south. So <coughs> that you have this really tiny proportion of people thinking about what it might mean to live with impairment for the vast majority of the world, not only is a form of scholarly colonialism, but it also contains a lot of epistemic fallacies. <coughs> so, um, so most Northern theory on disability treats disability as, as a category of thinking about anomaly. So anomalous embodiment, forms of embodiment or psychoaffective life that um, falls outside of the ordinary. So the normal, abnormal distinction that we get to think is like for Cohen that we've carried through within, within social theory. Um, however, when we begin to think from the global south, um, we recognize that Disability isn't something that happens through the accident, through violence as an event, through the unexpected, or through the life course as aging, um, which global dis northern disability theory imagines. So the temporality of disability is either the interruption of a future or the interruption of a form of futurity um, through the unexpected, through the event. Um, and one of the most um, 
utilized notions around disabilities, this notion that we're all temporarily able-bodied, that most of us at some point or, or another face the, 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 um, the possibility of disability, but it's usually through a conceptualization of violence, which is the interruption of the everyday, and, and that's Caldera. Right? Violence is the interruption of the everyday rather than violence as the ordinary everyday way in which many many subjugated populations live, live and many subjugators imagine society through so there's a kind of uh, uh, dualism in, in relation to the kind of uh, ontological imaginaries the temporality of disability also imagines um, to imagine that this is the accident that this is the interruption of violence is also an imaginary of a stable state so a geopolitics in which some states are stable, um, some sta states are stable and some bodies live in primarily, um, live in primarily a stable formations which can be managed, you know, so this is by politics, uh, the, the management of life, and it can be managed towards producing particular normative cells or normal cells. Um, so, so the duration of life and the way in which the life course is imagined over time um, is, already, is already located within racialized temporalities. Because when you begin to figure that for 80% of the global population, um, the stable state is a fantasy, the stable state is a fantasy <coughs> and it is, it's only occurs within particular um, pockets of existence which a lot of work has to be done. If we look at how whiteness operated in most of our societies or middle classness, the amount of capital that needs to be mobilized, the amounts of imaginative capital, the, the amounts of um, forms of material materiality that needs to be mo mobilized to create these sort of stable pockets um, produces, you know, particular um, duration of life for particular populations. So, so some people um, the mortality rates differ according to race, according to gender, the, the possibility of being impaired um, differs according to race, according to gender and the distribution, the di distribution of resources. So the biopolitical is always an already racialized, racialized formation of the social. So, um, oh, oh, so I'm moving there, but I'm not moving there. Okay. So the temporality of disablement um, um, requires a reckoning of settler colonial societies and the multiplicity of temporalities which we inhabit as differently located, located subjects. Structural violence produces, produces um, attenuated kinds of life forms, so shorter lifespans, uh, shorter lifespans, um, balance. Um, theorizes um, the idea of slow death, you know, attenuated life for, 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 for particular subjects. De um, uh, um, Julie Livingston speaks about um, debility as the ordinary in, in Botswana. So rather than thinking about disability as the exceptional state, most people who are um, subjugated to forms of colonialism, forms of coloniality, because colonialism is ongoing, um, are, are subjected to, to, to debilitating states. So if you don't have adequate health care, if you're dispossessed and you don't have access to, to material resources, the capacity for building life or creating life is, um, is, uh, is, is uh, shortened. But there's also, and, and this is something that is, is a little recent for me, is to also think about what this <coughs> ontological impairment for the subjugator might entail. So we know that within social theory, um, one of the ways to which coloniality was made was through the presumption of disjunctive or, uh, or um, temporality. So the other lived in forms of primitivity, which you, which you then have to you have to bring them into the state of into a civilizational state, right? And this is this is a this is this is a this is a, a very strange strange ontology to imagine that you live in one kind of temporality and the other lives in 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 a, in a different temporality. And I want to think of that as an ontological impairment that the way in which the nature of reality is is, is produced or thought through 
is 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 a kind of a kind of impaired modality. So that the the um, the political the forms of the political that we inherit actually produces this, <coughs> this cognitive dissonance around temporality. Um, so this temporal disjuncture is productive of, of and symptomatic of, of radical alterity because it both produces radical alterity but it also is a symptom of, of inheriting radical alterity. Disability is not a stable state either. You know, disability is is <coughs> something that happens over time. Um, it's continuing. So in states where you're debilitated. So if you live in in areas that are poorly resourced, you don't have um, adequate health care, you ha you're subjugated to multiple forms of violence. If you don't have food security, it means you don't eat enough to, to have the kind of bodily formation and psychoaffective formation that would enable you to excel, in the, you know, to start with. If there's violence in the streets every day where people are being shot, where people are being beaten, where sexual violence, gender-based violence, um, addiction, <coughs> etc., etc., all producing forms of life that um, that uh, reduce your possibility for surviving. <coughs> um, disability is not this event-based uh, uh, form of embodiment. It's rather it's a process. It's continually in flux, and you have states that are in continually continually in flux. Um, very frequently, you have the coalescence of multiple forms of impairment, so the temporality <coughs> of which disability is the question. As heirs and inheritors um, and ancestors, in, at some point in settler colonial societies, we also um, um, inherit intergenerational trauma, which carries across lifespans that we cannot carry ourselves, but we do carry in other ways. And so the question around disability within settler colonial society um, begs, like the when, the, the when of the when of disablement. Um, if if disablement has continued across your grandparents and your parents, and and it will filter into the lives of your children and your grandchildren. What is the before and after of this temporality? Um, and what does it do when we're so focused on futurity and we ignore? Right. It's very bleak, yeah? <laughs> <A little> bleak. <laughs> <laughs> but when you begin to think with intersectionality and you, you again, you know, begin to think around gender, uh, around gender, class, nationality, etc., etc., and the effects of this, these also have different kinds of temporalities that that come into play because you have. And so, so I, I, what I want to ask about the temporality of, of, of disability is to rather not ask about the temporality of disablement, but what is the temporality of health? So what is health and when is health? If we have this, if health is the idea of thriving, what and when is health rather than disability <coughs> within the context of settler colonialism and what that might allow us to think of. So, so this is the sort of theoretical who I'm fighting with and who I'm using. <laughs> so Ballant, um uses the idea of slow death and this is the continual debilitation of subject populations. I'm very interested in the, so, so this reading of Mbembe, I'm not this. oh my goodness. Okay, so this reading of Mbembe m m made me begin to ask questions um, of Foucault because thematic politics is the idea to let die, uh, via politics is you know the management of life. Um, but there's a there's a, a, a genealogy of thinkers who use the idea of to let die when they're thinking about about race, right? And so what what is allowed within this thinking is this temporal collapse. It's this collapse of of life into death. So Foucault, Agamben, you know, and uh, Agamben's Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, be alive, which he says eradicates, and these are all androcentric thinkers. This is, you know, and so the question of gender is indubitably, ti indubitably tied to how they're imagining the social and how they're imagining a particular kinds of worldings and the erasures of, of, um, and it's uh, the erasure of the relation and which forms of relation come into being within particular lives. So, so. 
what they're all doing in this collapse of life and death, in the way in which they're formulating this, because they ignore gender, they ignore class, etc., etc., is to actually collapse that life does not only happen in relation to the state, and, and they take on this idea of, of, of particular forms of sovereignty, um, and actually we don't live in states, sovereign states, you know, so the formation of the political is, is, at, is so wrong that I don't even know what they're doing. I mean, it, I, I actually don't. I, I read it and I, I don't understand what they're doing. Well, I understand what they're doing, <coughs> but I, I cannot relate it back to the world in which we live in because as feminist theorists, we have to think about how our lives are impacted. We think about the body in the world, you know, we, and, and what this means to live in the world. Um, anyway, so these sort of necropolitical, thanatopolitical, theories which they're so potent and they're so powerful and they are everywhere and they produce a violence in and of themselves because what they allow for are these ontological and epistemic erasures that are profoundly unethical and profoundly depoliticize the ways in which we live in the present. So so two two responses to biopolitics and the NATO politics. One is Jazz Bukira, she's just brought out the book where she looks at um, Israel Palestine and and she says, you know, the focus of la the looking at um, lo the focus on death ignores that within particular kinds of settler states that the right to maim is not to let die, that there's an abeyance of the of, of there's an abeyance of death, and the end is actually disablement. And so this, which, you know, with the forms of categorization that, is, that are used there, just, they fall apart. But what, what I'm finding really productive is someone called Rehalia, and she says, um, he, Rehalia. Yeah. It's a he. It's he. Yeah, it's Alexander, yes. Oh, okay, Rehalia. thank you. Yeah. Wow. But I do like that I'm, I have that I've feminized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll take that. Can we take that? Oh, yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> Can we take we'll that? Okay. Take so, so, and 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 what? What? Wow. <laughs> and you know what's funny, Tony? Really it's not at all ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> Very much indeed. Well, I, well, I, you know, I don't do the sort of googling. Let me just go and no, look at. No, no, I should actually. Should yeah. well, anyway. Yeah. That the politics focus on death and foreign and sovereign power and oh wow um, forecloses, you know the relational ontological totality of human of, of, of human life which which when you begin to think about you know the the forms of relations with, within which life lives our relation is not just to the state the state is one form of relation and how the state manifests is in multiple is in multiple ways and I'm going to well, you know, so, so, well, okay. So there are archival collapses. So what's the temporality of the archive is one of my questions because the ways in which the sort of genealogies that Foucault, Foucault, Agamben, and I mean, and they're serious, they're serious problems with the kinds of archives they, 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 they bring into relation to each other. And the, like, Agamben's profound misreadings of, of the Greek moment and the classical moment and what it meant to be exiled and what it meant to be dead <coughs> is, or, or, Create such <coughs> like you like you really just don't know what people are doing. Um, I mean, not that they're not good and not that they're not useful, because of course they're useful, but they require mediation. They require reckoning with with fleshiness in the world. But so so there's you know um, the 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 particular temporal collapses. There's a temporal collapse within the archive and those archival erasures. We they're not quoting feminist thinkers. They're not quoting. Um, uh, black feminist thinkers, and they're bringing together these really archaic, like Mbembe in particular, brings together this really archaic, anachronistic archive, and you ask, like, I, I don't understand what you're, why you're ignoring, like, 50 years of theorization. Um, um, yeah. Um, and so the temporality, the, there are particular temporalities of the archive within which we read modes of modes of embodiment. The <coughs> narrowed ontologies that we see again, you know, moves us away from politicizing and organizing new new modalities of thinking. So what I was going to do in my time that was up was to actually tell you some stories of death that came out of my 
that came out of my um, research, but I'm not going to. Um, Maybe at question time, we can return to that. So, and, and, and how they are beginning to allow me to, to rethink um, to rethink some of the the ways in which to to get into conversation with this theory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kanita. You've thrown up so many uh, fascinating um, um, conceptual um, challenges, and I think it would be really good in question time if, if you could tell us a story to just take us through what this might mean. You know in terms of thinking about a person's life uh, and thinking about temporality and stability in different ways. Thank you so much. Um, and we're now moving on to um, Cullen's research. Um, is this part of your book that you've just completed? Cullen has just completed um, a book, which I think is wonderful. Congratulations. Um, is this part of your thesis? You'll tell us now. Um. It is, it is not. It is not part of any larger project. I wrote it specifically for this occasion, and I think it will have some of that feel of a, like an invitation to talk rather than a sort of finished piece. Um, it's titled Reading African Gender and Thinking About Rape. By the time I actually started writing the paper, I did not want to think about rape anymore. Um, I think it, it is present, but, but obliquely. I began thinking about this paper with two related questions in mind. <coughs> what kinds of attention, analyses, and interpretations does Kimberly Crenshaw's conception of intersectionality yield and foreclose, make possible and shut down? And why are some African texts seen as worthy subjects of literary feminist analysis and others not? Some seen as being about gender, and thus as valuable objects of such an analysis, and others neglected. As I said, rather than a presentation of my definitive conclusion, this paper is intended to be an invitation to a conversation. I suspect intersectionality may be most powerful and useful as Crenshaw first employed it in 1989 as a way of showing how the US legal system was incapable of thinking along what it construed as two discrete axes of race and gender and thus was incapable of dealing justly with the woman of color plaintiffs who had filed an anti-discrimination lawsuit based on their conjoined racial and their gendered positions. Crenshaw's subsequent 1991 essay, Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color, outlines an incipient activist and academic field. To my reading within this essay, race at times stands in for economic status as well as immigration status, family configuration, and what Crenshaw refers to as culture. The metaphor of the intersection does not, I think, lend itself easily to critiquing an economic system in which class and race position do not align in only one way, in which, in other words, race relations are not class relations and race cannot be a proxy for class or vice versa. Sexuality is briefly acknowledged at the essay's outset and refers to sexual orientation, a binary conception given the man-woman understanding of gender within the essay. The model of the intersection is difficult to reconcile with the non-binary configuration of sexual and gendered experiences and oppressions, and more generally, in helping us theorize positions and experiences more layered and contingent than white woman, white man, woman of color, man of color, and within a world more complex than two binary systems. In mapping the margins, the intersection, even as one might add more and more axes or streaks to the spatial metaphor, seems to retain the notion present in the US law that Crenshaw originally critiqued, that multiple kinds of oppression are akin to an accumulation of discrete objects rather than contingent and blended products of a single system that is at once capitalist, white supremacist, and heteropatriarchal. <coughs> in his 2005 essay, Punk Theory, Tavia Nyong'o discusses the historical and faux etymology of punk and punked. Originally of English origin, he tells us, the word exists in African-American vernacular and carries several meanings, including that of being anally penetrated, an act imagined only as one of non-consensual domination and thus violation, to be punked. In a more general U.S. imagination, Nyong'o tells us, punked, having re-entered 20th century English via African-American speech, is imagined to be particularly black and thus of African origin and is often transcribed accordingly, punked with an apostrophe in place of an E. 
This, says Yongo, is a telling example of I dialect, raced, ungrammatical spellings indistinguishable in speech from grammatical ones. In other words, the spelling is supposed to signal the supposed blackness of the word. Citing Toni Morrison's Playing in the Light, Yongo continues that such I dialect can make a playground of the imagination out of the dramatic polarity created by skin color and impute African meanings, black meanings, as a way of simultaneously acknowledging and distancing a shared experience, state, or desire through spuriously ascribing it to black people. Morrison's central point, this is Nyong'o still, that race is produced out of an ongoing avoidance of an ongoing history of racist domination, rather than being a product of a benign diversity of ethnic heritages, is somewhat unfashionable today, despite the popularity of her novels. That's, that's Nyong'o's description. With this relational and thus situational conception of race, Nyong'o goes on to explore the meanings of punk and punked in US and British culture in order to ask for and propose a different kind of intersectionality. Might we theorize the intersection of punk and queer as an encounter between concepts both lacking in fixed identitarian referent, but which are nonetheless periodically caught up and frozen, as it were, within endemic modern crises of racialization? Might the reanimation re of this other intersectionality better equip us to re revivify both street and straight theorizing? This paper is not explicitly concerned with the social location of theorizing straight or street, and like Nyong'o, I am not now, nor have I ever been a punk. I am, however, intrigued by his call for a more complex and historical concept of intersectionality, which is perhaps also an invitation to think about systemic violence and social experience through other metaphors. To read and write about gender in Africa often still means to read and write about women's lives, experiences, or cultural production. Not only does gender still for many implicitly signify women, what it means to be a woman is still often taken to be self-evident. This despite many years of activism and scholarship that have challenged that conflation and that assumption. Work on the invention of binary gender and sexuality and its imposition upon Africa remains marginal. Rather than discuss some of the impacts of the situation on our lives, which I trust others can do better than I in this forum, I want to look briefly at two of its general consequences for what we read and how we read it. The first is that we often analyze gender primarily when there is a woman character or author. And the other is that we tend to neglect the texts or the passages and elements within otherwise recognized texts in which gender, class, sexuality, race, and the possession of social power do not align in the ways that we've come to easily imagine. Let me give one example of an overlooked text and suggest what we might be missing. The first French language text authored by an African writer is titled Les Trois Volontés de, Mal Volonté de Malik, Malik's Three Wishes or Three Desires. It was published in 1920. Commissioned by a French publisher, the colonial Senegalese educator Amadou Mahate Diane wrote the story for use in French West African schools. It's never been translated into English and receives only the briefest of mentions from scholars for an ostensibly self-evident, if unstated, reason it's pro-colonial propaganda and thus not literature, let alone an interesting object of feminist and decolonial critique. John's text is set in 19th century Wolof speaking village shortly after colonial conquest. So that means it's set like mid to late 19th century, not the time of the story's publication. At the story's inception, a French school is being <coughs> built, a supposedly exciting event for the whole village and one which provokes Malik's first wish, to go to French school. This wish is fulfilled as is his subsequent desire to continue his studies in the city. With joy, Malik departs for the city where he decides he wants to train to become a blacksmith, like that of the griot, a casted occupation in Wolof society. Despite strong opposition from the village, this wish too is realized. The story ends with the village transformed. Now a small thriving city, there are many shops and a factory-like workshop where Malik works as a smith, earns plenty of money and provides well for his mother and relatives. What kind of analysis attentive to gender and power might we begin to make? The narrative is almost entirely devoid of woman char characters. Malik's mother, who barely speaks, is an exception. One consequence of this is that tradition, or rather two indigenous traditions, is masculine, as is modernity. So both, both are embodied by male characters, 
female characters are not the primary embodiments of indigeneity and tradition, as colonial and enlightenment discourses might have it. The narrative contains conflict and resolution between three, not two, sometimes overlapping sources of authority, local and non-Islamic, local Islamic and, and French colonial, and between two discrete systems of formal education, French and Islamic. Several strange moments reflect efforts to manage this multiplicity in service of colonial ideology. When elderly men marvel at the formation of letters, this in a village where the reader has already learned Arabic script literacy is present. Or when the French school, clearly a competitor with the existing educational institution, is somehow still positioned as the only source of literacy and knowledge. The story's conclusion is a triumph of capitalist modernity, a fact evident not only in the village's small-scale industrial growth, but in the transformation of a caste of descent-based occupation into a free, capitalist career choice. Social, racial, and economic projects here are almost indistinguishable. Perhaps something like shifting <coughs> triads rather than two axes might capture the complexity of power relations in the story. I now turn to a better known text that nonetheless contains a critically neglected moment. Richard Rees' short story, Riva, was first published in the South African literary journal, Staff Writer, and then reprinted in a slightly changed version in his 1983 short story collection, Advance Retreat. Riva has not been a set work in post-apartheid South African schools, as have been others of Reeve's works, nor has it appeared in post-apartheid literary anthologies, as has the work of some of Reeve's contemporaries. Yet Riva has received some contemporary attention when it has been read as a gay or queer text. It appeared in 1990 in the first <coughs> anthology of gay and lesbian South African writing, The Invisible Ghetto and has been analyzed in artic as an articulation of queerness in recent books by scholars Brennan Monroe and Sean Fulhoun. The story therefore occupies a somewhat ambiguous position, not entirely neglected, but attended to only from the relative social and scholarly margins. Set in Cape Town of the 1950s, Riva's anchored in two fleeting encounters between the authorial protagonist and narrator, Paul, and the Jewish Riva. Rather than a story about Riva, as the title might suggest, or the story of a relationship between the two, the two characters, Riva is an account of Paul's perceptions of Riva and of a relationship that does not transpire between them. They first meet on Table Mountain hiking. In the second half of the story, they meet once more when Paul seeks out Riva at her shop in town. She invites him for tea at her nearby home, and the second interaction ends, as, the, as does the story itself, when Paul flees Reba's flat. There is, throughout the story, a constant tension between the two. Reba ironically proclaims that she is the queen of Table Mountain. Help, Paul tells the reader that is an absurd idea. Reba asks for Paul's recognition. Paul withdraws, then seeks her out, then leaves. Mm -hmm. In biographical outline, Paul resembles a young Richard Reeve. He is from the racially mixed working class area of District 6. He is classified as colored and he studies English at the University of Cape Town. Riva, the Riley self-described Queen of Table Mountain, is older, Jewish, white, and female, with no aspirations to join the English Academy. According to Paul, her self-presentation is masculine, incongruous, and disturbingly Semitic. Through their differences, the two are drawn to each other and are, in fact, similar to each other. Both are working class and live in adjacent, impoverished neighborhoods. Both occupy structurally ambivalent positions, the colored and the Jew respectively. Both deviate from the dominant gender norms of their time and place, and both demonstrate wordy wit and camp humor. At their highly self-conscious verbal battling, Reba beats Paul, Sean Fulhoun suggests. Her verbal repartee and queenly ironic self-fashioning is superior to his. Reba is, Yoon says, more a queen understood in the camp gay male sense than is Paul. Riva's brief comment to Paul precipitates his abrupt, never explained exit from her apartment. It's quite safe, I won't rape you. Paul then notes, this was a coarse <coughs> remark, I waited for her to laugh, but she did not. A few sentences later, as if Riva's words were actually an implicit threat, and he therefore in real danger, Paul runs down the stairs and into the street. Reba's comment lacks the levity, the mockery, and self-mockery of their verbal exchange generally. It's not tongue-in-cheek. But nor is it a threat, if anything, it seems that Reba is lonely and is, is sort of like pushing at Paul's never explained but presumably obvious unease. 
Riva's words nonetheless introduce the possibility of sexual violence in their very disavowal of it. It is that possibility, given the complex gendering of the two characters, and by extension of their creator, that is Reeve, which has, I suspect, bewildered readers. Scholars make no mention of Riva's statement, yet it is not only fascinating in its apparent opacity, it is also a crucial axis of the narrative. It precipitates the stories and the non-relationships unexplained conclusion. Even for the two scholars who offer queer readings of this text, Riva's comment passes without comment. So I think this is because within conventional understandings of gender, present even in the two queer interpretations of Riva's story, it is almost impossible to imagine a female person sexually violating a male person. Nor within a heteronormative binary understanding of gender is it thinkable that Riva is anything but a woman, albeit one who competes with Paul on his territory of camp performance and is in some way his double, as well as the double of Reeve, the author. It is analogously unthinkable that Paul is anything but a man, however codedly gay. In Crenshaw's 1991 essay, women of color specifically are intersectional. Presumably, however, everyone else is too, if we follow the essay's notion of the structural intersectionality. If the metaphor <coughs> is the intersection, then we are all inhabiting intersections which are differently, and to different degrees, sites of power and vulnerability. It is for this lost notion that many seem to find the intersection a useful shorthand, albeit to name what is, after all, not a new idea, either within South African or US leftist radical <coughs> politics. Among Crenshaw's abundant and sometimes overlooked predecessors on the other side of the Atlantic, I would name black US third world and Jewish feminists such as Gloria Anzaldúa, Angela Davis, Melanie K. Kentrowitz, Irina Kleptis, Sherry Moraga, Rosaria Morales, Aurora Levins, Morales, Adrian Rich, and Beverly and Barbara Smith, to start with. Poets, fiction writers, essayists, and fighters, like those who created foundational anthologies of the early 1980s, such as Home Girls, Nice Jewish Girls, and This Bridge Call My Back, and who are not directly responding to the rigid stringencies of the legal system, may offer us other metaphors and may draw our attention to texts, histories, and experiences that are raced and gendered in ways that we have not ourselves read, perceived, or experienced, as do in very different ways, ways Reeves' short story and John's work of pedagogical colonial propaganda. It is not enough, in other words, Jungo writes, to take up the simultaneity of race, class, gender, and sexuality which it is my argument that the vernacular does constantly in words like punk and punk. Rather, we must investigate the subject transformed by law that nonetheless exists nowhere within it, the figure of absolute abjection that is paradoxically part of our everyday experience. Nyong'o concludes his essay with thoughts about the intersection, that is, the worldly place, pervaded by discursive state and mechanical and technological violence where two streets meet. The intersection, he reminds us, is a location of discipline and danger for pedestrians within landscape long given over to automotivity. Long, that's his quote. So, in the practice of every day, he writes, for the vernacularly mobile are required to demand both their rights and more than their rights, simply to preserve a portion of the mobility they had prior to enclosure. Examples proliferate, workers become illegal immigrants, poor mothers become welfare queens, protesters become potential terrorists. All must attack the presumption of their criminality merely to preserve their way of life from the ongoing incursions of disciplinary power. Our responses will, by definition, be manifold. <coughs> the purpose of radical theory and politics is not to adjudicate among these responses, but to nurture them. At the intersection in the streets, we are all in punk city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can already see a thread emerging, and that is that challenge that both of you gave us to think about people embodying or being in spaces um, and, and, and challenging the legibility of those spaces and, and the way in which identities are assigned and then feed into a kind of legibility. That's, that's very interesting. Kulem, 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so in this paper, I'm going to be in conversation with Ahmad Dako's book, Faceless. And this is a work that I did with a colleague of mine who's based at the University of Cape Coast, uh, Teresa Adaimunumkum. Uh, so in this presentation, we examine Faceless as a novel that wrestles with and successfully engages the plight of the poor and the marginalized, and how they struggle to survive in a world that denies them legitimacy. As one pages through the book, the weaving together of experiences of pain, desire, resistance, resilience, and the yearning to survive bears <coughs> you in the face. These experiences are intertwined and often coexist as the characters seek ways to survive in a world that often appears ruthless and unforgiving. The interwoven life experiences of the characters point to how the assumed private pain and suffering leave visible scars that stubbornly refuse to be hidden when one is in public. The book exposes the perpetual structural challenges that infiltrate the homes and affect people's individual lives and cause damage that many have to contend with as they try and seek ways to resolve the struggle they so often encounter. When communities struggle with homelessness, unemployment, disintegrated families, gender violence, lack of basic services, and support from those who are supposed to be the custodian of a nation, a fertile ground for violence and disorderliness is established. The resultant frustration and a sense of helplessness lead to people seeking alternatives. And what the book does is that it covers a number of themes that are interconnected and through which Darko draws our attention to the persistent injustices that contribute towards the social ills that we continue to face. Now, the story is an investigation into the death of a young girl called Baby T, a child prostitute whose body is found dumped behind a marketplace naked, beaten, and mutilated. Darko skillfully reveal, reveals details about Baby T during the progression of the novel through her younger sister, Fofo, herself a street child who comes into contact with a group of women who run an NGO called Mute. This NGO is interested in documenting pieces of information pertaining to the community that no one wants to document but which are important. It offers space for the untold everyday stories to be recorded and acknowledged as legitimate knowledge and contribution in the preservation of people's lived experiences. So the organization offers voice to the mute. <coughs> so mute takes on Fofo uh, and unravels the mystery of her sister's death and eventually rehabilitates her. Baby T is the third child of Matsuru a woman who is supposedly cursed by her own mother when she was giving birth to her. Kwei, the father, disappears after the birth of Fofo, leaving Matsuru to fend for herself and her four children. Matsuru allows her children to go out onto the streets and do all sorts of work so that the family could eat. And when the children's father leaves her, Matsuru completely loses herself. She accepts and believes her situation to be the result of a curse, and because she harbors this negative perception, she is unable to help neither herself nor her children. The issue is not her inability to confront the problems, but the degree of decadence that has engulfed the society, and as such, that she probably thinks she will be or there will be no hope for restitution. However, her inability to see and effect change in her circumstances causes her children to become homeless. Where was home for Fofo, for baby T, and another child uh, who was living in the street orderly? These remain unhomed, even though in their own community, their country, uh, their personalities are formed on the streets and they are virtually without any proper socialization. The phenomenon of the street girl is engaged with in some details by Mrs. Kamame, <coughs> an owner of an NGO focusing on girls in the streets. <coughs> Her assertion that I would have liked to share with you. Uh, 
So this is what Ms. Kamame says, in the traditional settings of our villages, cohesion and familiarity is so imbued in the lives of individuals that women are more conscious of what they do. But in the cities, there is a fragmentation which results in behavioral flexibility. A woman like Fofo's mother, whose village happens to be the inner city Accra, is more likely to lose her sense of owners rather speedily when pushed by joblessness and poverty and the non-existent male support. Her physical and emotional detachment from her children is made less difficult in the harsh conditions in the inner city life. She let go of Fofo and her sister out onto the streets with virtually no guilt at all because her psyche had accepted the situation with ample ease. The above extract points to the complex ways in which the family structure and gender dynamics operate. The performance of womanhood and motherhood in particular seems to shift based on women's location. Mrs. Kamame highlights the difficult decisions that women often have to make in the quest for survival. While oftentimes it may appear as if women let go of their children with no guilt, the hidden transcript is usually more complex than what is visible. Matsuru's actions are seen as a result of what other people, mostly her mother and the men she loves, have done to her. Her aunt, Mame Kokro, appears to be one of the few people who believe that Matsuru should be in control of her destiny and get rid of Kwei, the father of her children, because he is worthless. She claims Kwei has not performed any marriage rights and that he is also, uh, having, hasn't got any stable jo job that will afford afford him the means to cater for himself and their growing family. Dako paints a picture of intergenerational suffering and provides a canvas that shows the interwovenness of the private family struggles and how these become displayed in public when children end up in the streets having to fend for themselves. Seen as innocent victims of society's neglect, these children, however, become the scourge that society fears the most. Bred on the violence of the streets, these children become incapable of discerning between good and evil. For them, the bottom line has always been survival, and they do what they can to survive. LeRue and Smith are said rightly that most street children are a result of dysfunctional families and that they wish to return home, provided circumstances at home would change. We see Odalis' desire to go home but her mother sacks her from the house anytime she goes there. It is difficult to imagine children like Poison who live on the streets as innocent victims of their parents' irresponsibility, <coughs> but that is precisely the case. Darko challenges and forces us to step back as we imagine and try to make sense of everyday struggles and their possible genesis. She cautions against the so often quick urge to judge and label without that dissecting and engaging with issues such as street children that are perceived as a nuisance and very problematic. Dako again appears to strengthen the idea of self-sufficiency and female solidarity. She presumes that the woman, apart from being able to question the circumstances that bother her life and of feeling life satisfaction not only in motherhood and its supposed related joy, should be her fellow woman's keeper. The contrast between Matsuru's perceived absurd behavior of keeping silent on her daughter's rape and Fofo's intention of finding out who killed her sister, as well as Diana's preoccupation to give mute a voice in the face of her own predicaments, points to the idea of solidarity. The intersectional spaces within which these women's narratives connect assist in showing the shift from the often assumed discourse of helplessness that Matsuru's story would be understood in if uh, looked at in isolation. The women's experiences highlight the interwoven notions of resilience, resistance, and speaking out against the system that renders them voiceless. This is a notion also highlighted by Motsenme in her contention that women release stories of pain loss, despair, and courage amid an overly strained everyday. Even though the women mentioned above have different challenges, they show a certain determination that foregrounds the writer's expectations of them. Inherent in the story 
are ample evidence of the solidarity that exists among women living and struggling together to take care of their families. Nanyomo in Fofo's house extends a helping hand to Matsuru by helping her feed her babies as well as advising her. However, the tragedy of Matsuru's life is also that she fails to accept help and advice in whatever form. When she loses all sense of uh, decency and allows her men precedence over her children, the women recoil from her, unable to understand what is it that makes a woman replace her children with sex. The recall from Matsuru by other women is indicative of the social milieu these women find themselves in. Placed in this urban jungle where traditional values of community have been thrown <coughs> away, there is a limit to how far a person can go in interfering in other people's lives. In the traditional setup, Matsuru would have had to deal with the full force of the women in the community who would compel her to do the right thing. The support she would have received in that setting <coughs> would have been stronger and able to help her turn her life around. Unfortunately, the urban jungle of Sodom and Gomorrah <coughs> preaches the victim of the survival of the fetus. These women's stories highlight the complex ways in which women continue to struggle within a system that continues to render women as second-class citizens. Matsuru's story points to the multiple burdens that many women so often have to deal with. Dako zooms in on how these interwoven challenges that women have to face play themselves out differently in rural and urban settings. Within the urban space, there seems to be minimal communal engagement and support as people have to find ways to fend for themselves and seek individual survival strategies amidst a harsh environment. Within this urban space, even the home may not necessarily be deemed a safe space as some of the violations have been made. And so the story behind the story, um, the, the author lifts women's agency and she gives space to their so frequently unspoken life stories. She offers a platform to those in the periphery who are repeatedly depicted as helpless and hopeless. While the novel paints a picture of multiple hurdles that women have to overcome, the author does not stop there. She offers the women a platform wherein they perform various forms of survival, resistance, hope, and facing suffering head on. This is in concert with Linda Alcock's claim that under conditions of oppression and restrictions of freedom of movement, women like other oppressed groups have developed strengths and attributes that should be correctly credited, valued, and promoted. The novel elevates women's voices and shows the entangled complexities of their lives, highlighting the successes and challenges that many women so often have to contend with. One of the major themes of the novel is the notion of gender inequality. Perpetual gender imbalance is one of the focal points of the novel, which speaks to the need for paying particular attention to this challenge. Dako challenges the master narrative of gender equality that is found in many of our policies and shows how there continues to be a disconnect between policies <coughs> and lived experiences. She zooms in on this challenge of inequality through the character of Cabrera. And this is illustrated here. Cabrera is the mother, wife, worker, and battered car owner that she was no day passed that she didn't wonder how come the good Lord created a day to be made up of only 24 hours. Because from dawn to dusk, domestic schedules gobbed her up, office duties ate her alive, her three children devoured her with their sometimes realistic and many times unrealistic demands. While the icing on the cake, their father, needed to do no more than simply be a regular husband and she was in a perpetual quandary. Through Cabria's character, Dako succeeds in showing the poverty of time that many women struggle with. The multiple tasks that Cabria has to single-handedly deal with highlight the inequalities that persist and the stubbornness of patriarchal systems that refuse to afford women the same position afforded to men in society. While the idea of equality might be read and beautifully articulated in many governmental policy documents, in reality, many women continue to bear the brunt of having 
unrealistic demands made on them, while men continue to simply be your regular husband. It is at the intersection of motherhood, professional woman, and being a wife that women's struggles remain faceless. The fallacy that these can be looked at and understood in isolation is one that Dako unravels in this novel. She unpacks the realities of those who are assumed to be without a voice. <coughs> one would think that in an environment like Accra, that is very cosmopolitan and with all the exposure that Cabrias' husband has received through his Western education and his contact with people from different parts of the world, his understanding of gender roles would have changed from the patriarchal conception to a more egalitarian one. However, the irony of the situation is that in spite of how modern the family has become, gender roles remain the same as they exist um, in, in other uh, patriarchal settings. Her husband remains resolutely traditional, refusing to lend a helping hand in the chores at home. In the morning when Cabria is busy getting the children ready for school, preparing breakfast and making sure everyone is settled, Adade, her husband, takes his bath, listens to the radio, comes for breakfast, and leaves for work. Everything else is Cabria's problem. <laughs> when examined in the light that this is a man who is enlightened enough to know better but does not, then it becomes clear that even Matsuru's situation with uh, the men in her life also uh, therefore should not be judged too harshly. Rather what becomes important is that while these men are not helping the women, the burden of the household chores, as well as the provision of emotional and psychological needs of the children, become the sole responsibility of women. In other words, it appears that although the man is present, he is absent. Therefore, the unequal treatment of women in the home spills over to the unequal treatment of people in the society. Um, okay, I'm just gonna skip a few things. Um, <coughs> there was an expect expectation from Fofo that as a citizen, she would receive support from her government. It is at this point that the notion of citizenry comes to the fore. Being a citizen means being protected, having your basic human needs catered for, and having access to resources. And Dako removes this veil of assumed citizenship when the expectation of a support, security, and general social responsibility is not met by those in power. She draws our attention to what happens when the government system does not provide needed resources for services to be rendered. Like, for example, a proper functioning police station. The novel points to how the police station stood in a very busy area and was simply put a sorry sight. Broken windows, leaking drains, cracked walls, and peeling paint. And we expect the, the, the police to be available and be willing to do their job when they also have to function. Um, within a system such as this. Because here, lawlessness becomes rampant when systems that are supposed to uphold the law are dysfunctional or neglected. The master narrative of a caring government becomes exposed when the hidden transcript of the citizens become public. When suffering glares people in the face through the presence of street children, the children become a constant and visible reminder of the shortcomings of the families, communities, and the government structures. Um, and just in, in conclusion, I'd like to draw from um, what was mentioned in the foreword of the book by Kofi Anudoho. Our society must also learn to do right by the class and economically disadvantaged people produced by our various failed development programs and too often condemned to a nightmarish existence in those sections of our urban centers systematically <coughs> overlooked by our planners of urban growth. Amadako's faceless is as much a story of children abandoned to the streets as it is that of our various Sodom and Gomorrah, whole communities abandoned to their fate by a self-satisfied and discriminatory machinery of state. Drawing from numerous challenges that people face, Dako shows how government structures are miles behind in meeting people's needs for a better life. Many communities cont continue to deal with inherited history of poverty, inequality, and oppression, which continue to go untroubled and uncontested due to their unwillingness to confront inequality and the haunting legacy of colonialism. She forces us to step back and confront the injustices 
as failing to do so would be destroying the fabric of society, leading to future generations that inherit the multiple traumas that many of our communities suffer from. What are the unintended consequences of perpetual inequality? When resources are not distributed equally, how can we claim or even imagine a just society? These are some of the unnerving questions that the novel throws at us, forcing us to look within and without as we continue to wrestle with social justice issues. We would like to conclude by arguing that DACO provides a stage for the performance of the imagined and at the same time, real life stories of those who are chucked into the margins, living on the fringes and underbellies of the society, where the general population and the government behave as if they do not exist, as if they are invisible, faceless. Thank you. fantastic um, panel and um, really three very rich um, papers I'm sure you all agree and um, we have tw 20 minutes left for questions so let me throw it open immediately and I think we'll take three questions and then uh, see how many rounds we can um, please can I if I can just ask you to keep your question fairly short and um, then we can have many questions so I have a question for our first speaker, and this is, I really thoroughly enjoyed your paper. It's fantastic. Um, and what I wanted to ask you is, what is the relationship between grieving and disability? Because it's, yeah. So that's, that's what I have a question about, in the sense that um, the notion of living with the dead, as apart from separated, you know, as opposed to separated from the dead, requires a certain amount of um, quotidian grieving. But grieving is also something that has to be, in a sense, moderated in order for the ordinary business of life to go on under its usual constructions. But maybe that's not a great construction. So I just wondered what the relationship was, if that's a clear to us. Thank you so much. Um, my question is also to the uh, um, Thank you for your presentation. It's really engaging. Um, and I think my question is quite linked to the first question. Um, but firstly, just to, I, I would like you to expand a bit about, you talked about how the uh, Agamben, Mbembe, all of them, uh, the epistemic violence, right, around um, the erasure and um, archives. And so I would like you to a bit find on that and that violence around how you're imagining that um, because part of it is that in social death the idea of grieving and living um, it's a management of that death right and the idea that uh, uh, so how do you then speak back to that to that idea that you know um, member kind of argues that idea that you are managing and biopolitics you are managing and you are uh, functioning through death and trying to um, they can living out of the death that you're experiencing and the everyday experiences of death. So perhaps just to expand on that, and then also just that moment of the epistemic um, violence, and perhaps a uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Can we have one more question, please? Mm -hmm. See, we have a question for our two other presenters. Um, Habiba, did you want to ask? Thank you. I apologize for being late. Misunderstood when we were starting again. Um, I was wondering if I could ask um, all three the um, the uh, presenters uh, to uh, give us a, to reflect on your intellectual lineage. Um, I, I, I partly am trying to be not parochial, um, but I am very interested in the way in which we, we speak a certain automatic lineage. Um, intellectual lineage that is. Uh, I'm very interested in um, what um, if you had to struggle to you know, find a, a lineage, an intellectual lineage that spoke to a, a various African contexts, or if you um, feel quite comfortable uh, aligning your work with a, you know, with a northern intellectual lineage or a mixed intellectual lineage. So I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the lineage. 
so 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 I did my masters at, at Chicago um, and one of the first courses you do is called systems and what systems does is it inducts <coughs> you into a philosophical genealogy um, and then into anth and systems too into anthropology so so you know it's this hot shot of Western philosophy, um, you know, the movement um, across time, the formation of the subject, formation of the social. And it was deeply uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we were expected for, for, our, for our PhD thinking to have at least 25 classical thinkers. So you, you, whether you wanted to or not, you were inducted into a mode of doing Western philosophy and carrying it. <coughs> carrying carrying it across so that we really kind of and and the and the, the one of the you know so you sit there and these conceptualizations of what the world might look like they're they're flat they're mm -hmm. they they're misreading but they're also fundamentally violent so even mm -hmm. though you know I, I do trace my lineage back to Western mm -hmm. so so. I mean, as an anthropologist, the question I end up with is the question of the archive rather than life in the world, which I'm supposed to do. That's where I'm supposed to go. And so my um, master's ends up looking at um, medical theory in Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, um, John Locke, also read Descartes and um, Smith. But I, I didn't do any work on them. And the question I had was um, how do medical knowledges and I did it really badly. Like it was very bad because I wasn't trained to do this kind of work in the first place. My first meeting with uh, philosophical texts, I, I, you know, I come from UWC, and uh, there was a, a reflex response to, to, to most of the ways in which these texts were being read. You know, the, the ways in which uh, the native and the other were framed in was uh, really like contemptuous. And I wanted to ask what the states were for having to use these texts, like which bodies are actually in operation. And, and I didn't know that I was really looking at ontology or epistemology at, at the time. And, so, and, and that was really the question. And what are the states of carrying across um, those ontologies and those epistemologies into the present? And what is the ways in which um, and and, and I, I'll be doing work much later because I, I think I finally might be beginning to grapple with the vocabulary that allows me to respond. Um, and so a lot of my work on disability. But I also I also take Hobbes very seriously, and I return my method, my epistemology is comes from Hobbes because what he does is he. Um, uh, and, and not him, you know, I mean that moment of classical philosophy, most people are looking on to at ontology and trying to, to, to think about what ontology might mean, what are the implications of ontology for um, the, how they're theorizing ontology for epistemology, I mean the last question of how do you know and what do you know it comes from how he imagines what the body might be in, in, the, in the essay, right? Um, uh, um, and, and what the implications then are for the political and the ethical, um, um, for then are the political and, and the ethical, and so they're, they're tied. And so, so I kind of do use that formulation. I do because I think it's very productive. Um, I, I find it very productive. I disagree, of course, with, with their conclusions, um, but I, I do find it productive. So even though I would trace. My intellectual lineage, I guess, back to that, it's, it's, it's not a, a gentle one. It's, it's one that's in constant uh, um, fighting. And, and what it's allowed me to see is the way in which, I mean, we we're situated now and the way in which we read, we, we're, we're immersed in an extractive modality of producing knowledge. And so you have this sort of trans-historical um, suturing together of of, um, of conceptualizations that are completely erased from the context towards new ends, but they're doing something in this sort of... So, so um, I don't know if that's an answer, but... Um, <laughs>
Um, so, so, so even though I, I would say I'm, I'm very much steeped within within a, a Western philosophical tradition, but 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 as its bastard child, was never supposed to inherit it, um, and and to ask what it does when I, when I'm expected to to actually work with that, um, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and then I'll answer the stuff. Yeah, yeah. Would you mind if we, if you all tackle the okay. question and then we move back to Kanita? Uh, so I, I don't, I don't see myself as an inheritor of a, a single intellectual lineage, or maybe a, a multiplicity of lineages. Um, it's a really good question. I think I draw on, I, I draw on like. I don't even think they're schools. Like some some different scholars and thinkers and return to some people repeatedly. I think this paper has a lineage, both in who I'm who I'm citing and calling upon and in this sort of litany at the end, which isn't so much directly informing the, the essay, but it's a um, but I feel like is perhaps a gesture towards an inclusion of how intersectionality has been taken up. Um, so I think I could answer with more specificity about this particular work, but I think the really just somewhat evident because it's, it's explicit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, thank you so much for that question. I think it's one of those questions that um, requires one to to <coughs> really think about where we come from as uh, scholars trying to find our space within. Um, such environments and spaces within the university. And, and so I go back as a student of psychology and, and, and thinking about what I was then embedded in, in terms of what psychology is, what it does, and how it approaches life, the world, uh, behavior, people interactions, and, and whose voices we, we were using, and in many ways still are using, um, and, and one sort of had to inherit that and start seeing the world in that way. And I think it was really um, when I started doing my PhD that I kind of got the opportunity to, to step back a little bit. So it, it was a PhD in psychology but also a doctoral certificate in gender studies and I think that's, that was the space for me where I got a moment to really just release and breathe. And I think the people that, you know, uh, uh, Moraga, uh, Anzal Dua, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, um, and you know Spivak, and, and, and in, in, in hearing about their stories, in hearing about the work that they're doing, it was a different kind of psychology for me. And I think for me that was a turning point. Um, and so I do some work in, in looking at African women writers and learning a lot in that regard. And and applying that in the psychology that I practice and the psychology that I teach. And I think what um, Tavisil spoke about this morning in terms of African spirituality, and that um, that is a, is, a, is, a, is one of the ways in which we can do psychology um, is very important in the role of spirituality and how that remains absent um, in the psychology. And, and we are spiritual beings. Um, and therefore, how can we even understand the ways in which we engage with each other if that's not an integral part of what we do uh, in the work that we do? So I think it's an, it's an ongoing journey of a lot of and learning many of the things that were very, um, were not useful, um, but at the same time were also very violent um, in, 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 I can say, in indoctrinating us in, in, in how we engage. And, and what is deemed as being an intellectual and not, and who can speak uh, with authority within a particular discipline. And if you don't speak in that particular way, then your voice sort of, you know, is put in the margins. But I think um, I'm owning my, my voice more and more every day and not being apologetic about it. Mm. So, so grief is one of the things I want to think about. Um, um, so, so I'll tell you maybe two stories. Um, so, two of my two of my participants, um, Z and Jonathan, both shared like, suicidal ideation, 
uh, when they become so so I did some some research I did some life histories with men in London and all of the men and, and one woman in, in Lovely Hill and, <coughs> and there are other people in middle class and all of the people in Langa um, become dis well this particular form of dis disability um, through being beaten, stabbed, shot. Um, so acts of violence. Um, so both Mzia and and Jonathan have been, you know, gangsters um, pre prior prior to to being stabbed. Um, Mzia gets stabbed in his brain, and so he. He has a speech impediment and um, difficulty walking. Though when he um, was first, when he first got to hospital, they, they they didn't give him any chance of walking. They said your life is you know you'll, you'll be in a wheelchair. And, and despite being told this, he trains himself into being able to walk. You know, um, though though not easily. Um, but there's a remarkable loss of status, and so he uh, he sh he shares how he for a very long time he wanted to die, um, and he you know he goes to a herbalist and he, um, he he's given you know medicine to purge, and if he does this long enough and he does this for over a year, he'll he'll return to the old self. I mean, and the desire is for a return to the old self. So the way in which grief works its way out is to grieve the present, and, you know, to grieve the present so that there's a return, return to the to, to the old self. Um, so he purges um, uh, for about a year. At the same time, most of his family is very religious. Um, you know. Most of his family is very religious. Jonathan's not so much. You know, Jonathan's story is one of multiple kinds of abandonment, uh, you know, by his parents. But, um, and and he wants to die. And he says, I, I don't even know how I would attempt to die because you know he's in hospital. <coughs> he cannot move. He's, he's a lot more. His body has a lot less capacity to 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 enact suicide. Um, and the point that he is most determined to die, a pastor turns up, and and this part he says this pastor has been coming to him all the time, and he, he just didn't hear him. But the pastor says to him, you know, when you surrender, you, when you surrender to God, you know, a different possibility or manner is. And Z's family. Um, uh, uh, brings him back into the church too, and he too has the story of conversion. And the story of conversion becomes, becomes you know, this story of salvation of a particular sort, because the body, the release from the body, and the release from the violence and the humiliation of living in this embodied state within a, within a state that provides minimum amounts of care and that has relegated, um, uh, both MZ and Jonathan, in different ways, um, to to lives that they don't think is livable. You know, they, you know, just the experience of, of of seeing the vulnerable body in in the streets is, is, is a life that's not livable. And so, the night of politics is, is largely a bit of a, a company. These are largely sort of secular forms of politics, and and they ignore. Um, they ignore the ways in which um, other sets of relations, the family, the family, the church, um, the church, steps in into spaces where the state might be absent to produce livable lives. Um, and so, the ways in which um, the you know the ways in which the idea of sovereignty overshadows. Other forms of social organisation um, that is ever present in people's lives, because religion is ever present um, in many people's lives from the communities that we come from. It's only in theory that the sphere of living is is separated. Up. And when Mbembe is reading the text that he's reading, he's taking a long time <coughs> the absence of 
of put other forms of, of mm -hmm. living. So, so when I'm speaking to those epistemic erasures that happen in Mbembe, when you look at how, like the critique of black ways, and I think it, it quotes five women, one of them is a master thesis. Um, um, and you read this text, right? You, and, 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 and of course, it's, you know, it's brilliant, but it, it also, it, it, it forces you into this bizarre anachronist, this cognitive dissonance. And the text is so anachronistic because the archive stopped somewhere in the 60s. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange. Like, who, like, where are all these women writers? And in this review, I asked, like, oh, did women, do women not have reason? What does it mean beyond the gendering of scholarship? Um, beyond the gendering of scholarship, um, you, you know, if you're just reading, writing about men's re white men's reason towards black men's reason, because that's what he's kind of doing, right? <laughs> Do women not have rationality? But and 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 like he says, there's this moment where he says, like he hopes that he's seeding hope. What kind of hope do I have? I'm completely. This is not for me. You're not writing to me this kind of erasure. I mean, so so who is the grief for when he's talking about loving loving in, 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 in death? Who is the grief for? And you can only write about the collapse of life in death when you ignore life. Because life as it is lived is lived with love and with hate and with animus and with all that petty and beautiful and glorious ways in which we're, you know, alive. And, you know, we're not flattened ontology, you know, we're not these flattened, we're people who, even like me, if you, if you get to know me, you know, I'm social awkward, I want to hide in the corner, I'm introvert, whatever. But even we're in relation to other people, and those relations, like the relationship of the state to the subject, manifest in different ways. Who is the face of the state? So one of, so, so okay, so I still got it. I think so maybe we can look because I thought we could maybe one quick move one yes, more round of questions and then you can grab Kanita over lunch which yes. is coming up and, and ask her um, to expand a bit more but can we have uh, another round of questions for our panel quick question are we all fatigued and ready for lunch? Maybe okay. I can just ask a question because I thought um, this this phrase uh, violence is ordinary and, and and a state that's not stable, a state that is absent, is actually run through the three papers. And I was wondering, um, you know, because you speak about you know lives are lived and and and, and you um, talked a little bit about solidarity and resilience in in the face of this. And, and Cullen, I was wondering whether your question about intersectionality as, as flattening out differently located or, or as only reading certain kinds of um, subject positions or as fixing subject positions in particular ways. You know, what is there, can you also give us, um, like what are the kinds of responses um, to that perhaps because because, you know, it seems like in all the papers that there are ways in which individual embodied subjects live and carve out spaces that are some, somehow a response to that ordinary violence that is faced every day. So maybe if you want to speak to that, otherwise we'll wrap it up. Oh, oh, we have another question. Yes, I was interested in just something that the reason around um, it's something like an indigenous psychology and um, you know moving towards uh, the, the, the kind of thing your, your, your paper is, is talking about um, pain, experiences of pain, experiences of you know, of oppression of, and, and how might an indigenous a African centered psychology uh, respond to some of these uh, both uh, individual as well as social community uh, issues. Um, just your, your thoughts of the interest in together. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, last quick question. Mine is not a question. I'm going to be very quick. She raised something on pain and we talk about female genital mutilation which is the problem that is common in West Africa. I'm just making a plea and I'm calling out on all our sisters that 
we are faced with female genital mutilation, which is the cutting of the woman's clitoris. And that is hegemonic masculinity, the dominant form of a man and the subordination of woman. And when you cut a woman's clitoris, you are humiliating her. And the challenges that come from that leaves, leaves the woman with a lot of stigmatization, a lot of death problems, a lot of complications. 17th September this month, in Burkina Faso, 50 women were mutilated. And they all landed at a hospital in Burkina Faso. There are sisters. You know, this is what I went to America to talk about. Last year I spoke about it. So I'm calling on other African sisters that look, our sisters out there, there is this problem. Our keynote address speaker raised it. You know, I'm, I'm raising it again because it's one of the challenges of the African woman. We, we need to put our heads together and find out how we can help other women. 50, 17 September, BBC took it on Facebook. Dying, wasting, because there are women, they have to be mutilated, they die, no destiny, no life. So that's just what I want to add to what she said. Thank you so much. Okay, last response. <coughs> Callan and Fulay. Mm. Okay, no, thank you very much for the comments and, and the questions, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, well, the book raises quite an, a number of issues which are all really interrelated, and I think in many ways um, we can relate to in terms of the challenges that we are currently faced with. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, <coughs> it, it is the, the idea of pain and how that manifests in, in many different ways. Um, so the, the, the character of um, the, the sister, for, for, uh, and, and, and that's where for me the idea of the role of the government uh, citizenry and who is in charge and whose responsibility is it to make sure that people are fine. Um, because she kept asking, but why can't we go to the government? Why can't we go to the government to ask for help, to ask for assistance? And, um, and the example of the police station, I think, is in some ways um, the, the NGO telling her about that and actually driving her there to go and see was in some way a response in terms of the ways in which the government can or cannot assist you. Um, and, and, and that, for me, I think... Um, highlights the, the importance of uh, the role that communities play. I think what you said earlier in terms of the churches um, and, and, and other structures that people draw strength from, uh, the, the family, not only the nuclear, so-called nuclear, but the extended family. So the, the, the wealth of love and caring and support that reside in those spaces so when you're talking about resilience, it's not resilience as it's theorized within the psychology textbooks, but resilience in terms of how people find ways to to survive and not only on their own, but as, as a collective. And, and the importance of understanding that collective for one to be able to survive. And, and I link this to your your question, Tabi saying, in terms of African psychology, because I think that's where for me it becomes very important um, when you're thinking about indigenous or African psychology and this m moving or shifting away from the individual but acknowledging the, the relatedness of people and when you're thinking about this young girl who was found mutilated and dead and as if she, she was not human or nobody cared and linking that to the mother's assumed curse that you know she experienced when she was giving birth to the children and looking at how um, the the rituals the processes that happen within communities are important for us to be able to to confront and, and to respond uh, in those moments um, and not just be quick to to label or pathologize or say uh, she's an uncaring mother if she looked after her children then this would not have happened but looking at the broader structural um, issues that that might have contributed to that and looking at the the human resources that are there to be able to assist her to be able to to survive uh, and to continue living so that idea of uh, relatedness among us as people, I think, assists us to be able to understand how people engage with each other and engage with the environment as well, and in ways in which how that could also contribute as we move uh, in the process of healing. Yeah. I will try and be very brief. I think, I think, um, sort of systemic or structural violence that is a part of everyday life and needn't be a sort of discrete physical 
visible physical act of violation is something that carries through all three papers. Um, and my, my invitation was to think about if and, if and when and how intersectionality is helping us think about the multitude of those um, experiences, not just hopefully of violence, but also of pleasure or sociality or other, other elements of life. Thank you for a very challenging, thoughtful panel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.